Hi, I'm Harry Rock, and welcome to another edition of Westfield Council on Aging Presents. This is a special collaborative effort between Tina Gorman, Executive Director of the Westfield Senior Center, and Pete Coles, who is the producer of WCPC Westfield Cable Channel 15. Our topic today is conversation and dementia, and our guest is the one and only herself, Tina Gorman, Executive Director of the Westfield Senior Center. You know, Tina, normally you're feeding the names of our guests into mm -hmm. me, and mm -hmm. I never talk to you. I never see anything other than look forward to an email from you. And how excited are we today? I'm ready. Both producer Pete Coles and myself to have you in the studio with us, uh, really to talk about dementia. And I have to tell you, unfortunately, as I'm, I'm starting to gracefully age yeah. into those uh, upper age uh, ranges, uh, dementia... Uh, is becoming part of my vocabulary because yeah. family members and mm -hmm. friends and colleagues and people of that nature yeah. are starting to struggle with that. So I think this is a conversation, yes, <laughs> um, yes. quote unquote, uh, about dementia that I think people really enjoy. So Perfect. let's let's dive right into let's it. Let's dive right in. Well, you know what? Let me start, Harry, by saying that several years ago, um, Beth Cardillo, who is the executive director over at Armbrook Village. Um, presented this idea to a group of us in the profession, in the field, about a dementia-friendly community. At the time, I hadn't heard of it, and I don't think a lot of people in Massachusetts had, and certainly not people in Boston, um, but Beth had read this article about communities, I think it started in England, becoming what they consider to be dementia-friendly. Mm. And it's really, it's an effort to educate everyone in the community, from children all the way up to older adults and everyone in between, a little bit about dementia so people understand some of the basics um, so that if you're confronted with something, you know, whether it's our first responders and going out to a house and having a bit of an understanding about um, how you would, how you could be a f the most effective when you're working with someone with dementia. Um, and of course, certainly family members, you know, benefit mm -hmm. from the information as well. So um, Beth went after this and decided to go after the, there's a cer certification process to get a city or town dementia friendly certified and hmm. Massachusetts was or uh, Westfield was the first city in Massachusetts to become dementia friendly and in really? fact oh. as far as we know one of the first on the east coast really so congratulations to Beth Cardillo yeah. she is such a you know forward thinking person right. um, and so ultimately we had a secretary of elder affairs who um, decided her mom had dementia and decided to make this a state effort. And so oh. now Massachusetts has a whole effort called uh, Dementia Friendly Massachusetts. Hmm. Um, there, you know, there's a whole educational process for getting city and, cities and towns on board. But I always like to brag and say that Westfield was the first in the state. Thanks to Beth Cardillo, not myself. I supported all of her efforts. Um, so once we kind of establish that, now it's sort of this ongoing process of educating people. And, um, you know, it occurred to me that a lot of our first responders and our former mayor, uh, Mayor Dan Kanapik, went through the training with my staff. We've had a lot of our volunteers go through the training. So, um, but, you know, we, you get staff turnover, you get... So we have to keep retraining and re-educating. So one of the most important things, and one of the things I think that, you know, sort of Joe Q public would often have to deal with dementia if they don't have someone in their own family, um, is, you know, what happens if you're in a situation in public mm -hmm. where it becomes obvious to you that someone is struggling with memory loss, confusion, and things start to escalate, which they, they can do quickly. Mm -hmm. So what I really want to focus on today is conversation and, and, and dementia. Okay. So how do we talk to people with dementia? Because the way that we communicate with people um, really can set the tone and can really make a situation that might be challenging much improved or, if you do it the wrong way, a lot worse. So we want to we want to work on that much improved. So I want to look at this from a couple of different points of view. And the first one is um, helping the person with Alzheimer's to 
communicate what they're trying to say. So um, there are a lot of different ways that people with uh, dementia experience um, changes in how they express themselves. Um, you know, we know that communication revolves sending messages and receiving messages, and that's how we relate to one another. Um, but communication is more than just talking right. and listening. We know that. It's your tone. It's your body language. Um, right. We had this conversation at the senior center the other day among the staff and how many of us talk using our hands. I talk using my hands. <laughs> my mother used to joke with me and say when I was telling a story, sit on your hands. And, you know, all of us, a lot of us My, do my that. hands tend to be active exactly. as well. Well, but part of the reason for that is because I do work with a population who uh, many of them have hearing loss. So it's my facial expressions. It's one oh, of the reasons sure. why wearing masks became so difficult for so many of our seniors. I never thought about that. Oh, yeah, because they couldn't read. Sure. They couldn't do lip reading. I have some people right. who, you know, kind of do a little bit of lip reading along with everything else, but they also couldn't see facial expressions as well with a mask on. That is a So that presented point. a lot of challenges to right. our seniors. Um, so, but all of that has to do our our body language, you know, how we carry ourselves, mm -hmm. how we hold our head. So all of those things are things that we need to pay attention to when mm -hmm. we're working with folks with dementia. So the way that dementia can affect individuals sometimes has to do with where they are in the process. Are they are they new to the diagnosis or are they kind of in the earlier stages? Are they somewhere in the middle or are they pretty far progressed? Um, and all of that impacts how they communicate with others. So especially when someone is uh, newly diagnosed and early on in the stages, one of the first things that we see is difficulty with word finding. And in fact, sometimes that's a tip that somebody's having problems with dementia they can't find the words, especially to some simple things. Um, you know, this. Uh, and they may not be able to get that word paper. It's, you know, the, the you write on it. You know, so they may, and if you say paper, yes, yes, paper. So, you, mm. so you'll, that's very common. Um, sometimes people with dementia will use words that are familiar to them repeatedly, but they're out of context, you know, they don't make sense for, but it's the word they can remember, so they're just gonna plug it oh, in there, okay. you know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes people with dementia lose their train of thought. That's very common. Well, we all do that, but, but it's you know, even more common. You start to feel like right. I, I, I lose words, like, I lose check, my check, train check. of thought, I'm yeah. thinking, uh-oh, do I have dementia? But it's more to right. an extreme, you right. know, it's more to an extreme. Right. It may be, and this one is really challenging for families, and I, I dealt with it in my own family, it may be that people revert back to their native language. Oh. So my grandparents, three of my grandparents came over from Hungary. Wow. and spoke Hungarian fluently. And my father's parents, who both spoke hung Hungarian fluently, when they were alone together, only spoke Hungarian to each other. And the dog. They had a dog that only understood. If you, We went in as kids, oh, you know, when we funny. would visit to say, we would say to the dog, sit. The dog's looking at us like, what are you talking about? But if you said it in Hungarian, would oh, understand. That's funny. Well, my grandmother had dementia. And as it worsened, she completely reverted back oh, to wow. only speaking Hungarian, okay. not a lick of English at all. Um, and that's fairly common. I've worked with seniors who have gone you know, back to speaking Polish or German. So that's common. Mm. Um, sometimes, and very often, again, as the dementia progresses, people will just speak less often because communication becomes so challenging. It becomes challenging for them to get their message across, and it becomes challenging for them to understand messages that other people are giving them. So in a sense, they kind of give up. That's often common, also common with people who are hard of hearing. You'll see them start to retreat. And of course, the problem with that is it creates social isolation. So mm. that's, that creates a whole other problem that we want to avoid. Right. Um, and then the other thing, and the reason that I talk with my hands so much with this population is they do seem to lean more on using nonverbal cues. So they're going to pick up your facial expression, your hands. You know, are you asking a question? Are you, you know, um, giving a, um, a, some guidance? So all of those. So when you interact with someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, it's helpful as you go along to kind of try to figure out a little bit about where they are in that spectrum. Okay. Okay. So let's start with, um, and this I find this to be 
really challenging. I find this to be the most challenging. So we're going to start with that, which is understanding what the person is trying to say to you. Mm -hmm. That can be really challenging when they can't find the words. Right. So first of all, you know, you just have to be patient and you, you want to establish eye contact. You want to kind of project, you know, a reassuring attitude because they're struggling and you don't want to be judging them. You don't want to be, you know, tapping your foot or, you know, doing this with your hands like, okay, come on, what, do you, what, 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 you know what I mean? Because all that does is get them more agitated. And we all know, even without dementia, when you're agitated or you're upset, it's hard to think clearly. It's hard right. to think straight. Right. So you want to kind of create that calm atmosphere, you know, nod your head like, okay, you know, take your time. And you can even say that, take your time. Mm. Um just encourage them to keep working on it, you know, like don't, you know, don't kind of throw up your hands and say, okay, well, I don't know what you want, so forget it. You know, you don't want to do that. Just be encouraging. Um, try not to interrupt uh, because sometimes the person will come up with, if not the word, the person will give you enough of an indication and you'll be able to figure out what they want. Sure. You know, let's say they want something to drink and they can't come up with the word drink. Um, but they may come up with the word cup or they may, you know, go like this or they may, you know, kind of signal that they're hungry or thirsty. And so that you can kind of, you know, guess that a little bit. So try not to interrupt. Um, don't correct or criticize, um, in which we see that very often with caregivers. Mm -hmm. They'll correct the person or they'll criticize the person. And they're not really meaning to be mean it's more out of frustration and impatience and like, oh my gosh, you know, we've been through this 20 times today. And it is challenging to be a caregiver, to give people time to try to express themselves. Um, don't argue. You will never, I say this to families all the time, you will never win an argument with somebody with either dementia or Alzheimer's mm. because you can't really reason with them. So um, that's just going to make it worse. The person's going to become agitated. The situation is going to escalate, and they're never going to be able to get their message across when they're in that condition. Mm. So you really want to just keep things calm um, and focus on feelings and not facts because very often what the person is trying to tell you isn't so much a factual. It's they're trying to tell you, Either they're hungry, they're cold, they're upset, they're frightened. Um, and so just trying to um, understand the feeling behind the words is really, really important. Okay. The other thing that I think is crucial when you're trying to communicate with someone with dementia or Alzheimer's, and especially when you're trying to understand what they're trying to tell you, you have to minimize distractions. And again, I would go back to this is the same for someone with a hearing loss. You got the TV blaring or the radio going or you're in a room with, you know, right. six or eight people who are having several conversations. It's very difficult for them to focus. So you want to minimize the distractions. When I used to do visits, when I was used to do nursing homework and I would go in and visit with my with my clients or my patients and oftentimes they were watching television. And the first thing I would say to them is, do you mind if we shut the TV off? Mm. Because even if I turn it down, they can compete. see. Right. And that's distracting. And it's your, it's your brain saying, a wait a minute, tip. I got to, right. we're trying to pay attention over here. And, oh, what's going on over there? What's she doing? What's, so you really want to right. eliminate those distractions. <clears throat> if, um, if the person is like in, when I used to do nursing homework, if the person was in the day room, and even if the television wasn't on, but other people around, you know, you just want to go to a quieter place because you're, you're more apt to have more success with the person being able to concentrate and come up with whatever their message is. So those are really important things. Yeah. Good um, they are. And, you know, but know that there are times when it is just really going, you're just not going to get it. You're just not going to get it. And in those cases, what I say to the person, I try to understand, is the person, is there panic in their voice? Or is there just um, 
anger because they're they're upset because they can't get their message across. If it's panic, I, then I'm trying to figure out: is this an emergency? You know, do they have to use the restroom? Do they are they really cold? Are they really hungry? Or you know, whatever. I'm trying to figure that out. But if it's more anger because I'm getting frustrated because Tina, you have no clue as to what I'm trying to say. Then what I'll sometimes say is, you know what? Let's take a little break. Let's come back to this in in five minutes, okay? I'm not thinking clearly right now. I need a little break. So let me let me take a little break and I'll get back to you because, you know, kind of putting the onus on yourself, right. not on them. You're not using the words. You can't find the words. You're not telling me, you know, I I can't I can't understand what you're saying. It's more like, you know what? I've been having a rough day. There's so much going on. I'm having a hard time thinking clearly. Can we come back to this in a couple minutes? Because what will happen is this. Either in a couple minutes, the person won't come back to it because it wasn't that important. Then it's done. It's forgotten, but everybody's calmer, you know. Um, or they will come back to it. And at that point, you may have maybe gotten more information. Sometimes it's a matter of checking with somebody else. If you're a caregiver, you know, checking with somebody else in the family. Oh, I know what dad was trying to tell you. You know, he, he I think he wants his red sweater. You know, sometimes somebody else knows better than you do. Um, so those are all kinds of things to just keep in mind. In their mind, do they think that they're communicating and you're the problem? Or are they aware of the fact that they're struggling to get information out? Well, that is an excellent question, Harry. And generally, the answer to that depends on where they are in what I call their dementia journey. Mm. If they are earlier on, and I always say there's sort of this line with dementia Early on, the person is aware that something is wrong. They're aware that either they're not being clear or you're not getting this, but there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And somehow the problem relates to them. Somewhere along the line, if they, you know, if they, if they progress in their journey, they'll cross a line where they don't really know that they have dementia, so then it's a whole different ball game. Right. Now, they may still get very frustrated because you're not getting what they're saying, but they don't really know why. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And then it's really just a matter of some of the basics. You know, I'm hungry and I want a snack. So, like, why aren't you getting in my head? It's like, I want food. But they can't think of the word food or snack or, you know, have the ability or get the words out. And, so, you know, and generally what we find is that, again, as people journey into that, their vocabulary becomes more and more limited. So they sometimes just can't remember. So the answer to your question is it, it, it depends on where they are. It okay. could be that they are aware. They could have crossed that line where they're, okay. they're no longer aware of okay. why, but it's just right. frustrating that I can't get my message right. across. Okay, yeah. that helps with that. Okay, so let's get into helping the person with Alzheimer's and other dementias understand what you're trying to tell them, so whatever your message is. And there are a lot of really good tips for doing that. So I, this is to me, this is a little bit easier than the other <laughs> um, <laughs> because, well, because we have more control over this one. Mm -hmm. You, as the person who's trying to get the message across, you have lots of control in how you do that. When you're trying to understand, you, ha you have less control. Right. So it's a little bit trickier. So let's just get into some okay. of the basics here. First of all, one of the basics is to identify yourself. Um, you want to always approach the person from the front so that the person isn't startled or, you know, because you know how that is. Again, even a lot of this, put it in the context of someone without dementia. You know, somebody approaches you from the back and you jump 20 feet. It's like, oh, my gosh, you scared me half to death. Mm. You're, you know, you're already in a mindset of right. you're a little upset, right. you know, so it's hard to communicate. So I find a lot of times with uh, folks with dementia, you want to identify yourself. For instance, you know, I'm Tina. I'm Claire's daughter, you know, I'm Harry, I'm, you know, Bob's nephew. Right. And so whether or not they get that, it's like, again, it's like, okay, well, this person, I'm not exactly sure I got all that, but they're somebody I should know. I should, I'm comfortable with them because it puts it in some kind of context mm. for them. So identifying yourself, just don't assume that the person knows right. who you are. Because oftentimes, again, as people journey into their dementia, spouses, they may think their spouse is actually a parent. 
So that gets a little distorted. So um, addressing the person by name is important. It's not only courteous, but it'll also help to get the person's attention. So if I were going to speak with you, I'd say, Harry, I'm Tina, you know, Claire's daughter. I just, you know, wanted to say hello or ask a few questions or, you know, whatever. So it just kind of helps to put things in sure. context right, right out of the gate. Okay. Okay. You want to speak in short, simple, familiar phrases as opposed to long sentences and, and explanations because those can be really overwhelming for folks with dementia. Mm. They need shorter sentences, phrases um, that get the message across. You know, we're going outside or, you know, we're going to take a walk. Let's get a jacket. As opposed to, oh, we're going to take a walk today because yesterday it was raining, but and tomorrow they say it may rain, but today it's so, you know, I mean, you go on and on and on. They are, they lost you. Mm. They just lost you. So keep it short. Um, <laughs> again, you go back to you can't reason with someone with dementia. So you want to avoid all of those long explanations. I will give you a wonderful example God rest her soul. And my mother is probably up there watching, you know, just in, in just mortified. But my, my mother was one, and I have to find, and I find myself, my husband will tell you I can do the same thing, of providing explanations for everything. Um, and my father what, had Alzheimer's disease, and, you know, that just becomes overwhelming. And I kept saying to my mom, you don't have to over-explain, you know. If he says why, you know, get your jacket, we're going out. Why? We need to run some errands. That's all you have to say. You don't have to give them the laundry list if we're going to the bank and we're going to Walmart and we're going to do this. We're going to pick up your prescription. You know, say, forget it. All you have to say is we're going to run some errands. And it's cold. It's chilly. Yeah. Let's get a jacket. Done. End of it. Be done with it. So keep it short. Um, this is hard for me because I'm a Jersey girl. But you <laughs> really want to speak slowly and distinctly. And we tend to, especially when people are having communication difficulties, we tend to, that tends to escalate a situation. And I find that people begin talking even faster because they're trying to offer, again, going back to what we just said about keeping it short and simple, they want to offer these long explanations. You know, if someone says, and I've had people say this to me, I'm like, okay, let's go get your jacket. We're going out. No. <laughs> mm. Well, that's pretty clear. <laughs> um, now, again, you can go back to, is it necessary to go out right then if clearly the person really doesn't want to? Or, or is it like, yeah, we have to. You have a doctor's appointment or something. you know. But again, you don't want to get into that long, well, we have a doctor's appointment. We've already had to change this appointment three times, and, you know, on and on and on, which caregivers sometimes tend to do. So, Speaks, and then you start to get into as they're becoming more obstinate. Now you're talking faster because you're trying to explain all this stuff. No, no, you don't understand. And now it's getting late, and we got this appointment. It took me three times, and I was on the phone, and blah blah. blah. You know, and pretty soon you're off and running, and they're lost. Mm. So try to keep it slow. Just try to speak slowly and distinctly, and also a lower pitch. So men sometimes do better with this than women. A lower pitch generally. Uh, equates with a calm atmosphere. Hmm. If you notice, and I ha I'm very conscious of this, as women get more excited, their voice tends to go yes, up. Yes, correct. It's higher pitch. And for somebody with dementia, even if they don't know what you're saying, that high pitch equates to panic, right. um, you know, frustration, impatience, you name right. it. Nothing good. <laughs> Right. So you want to keep your pitch low as much as you can and speak okay. slowly. That's a great tip. Yeah, absolutely. And again, especially for women, we tend to, our voices go up as we get more upset. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact. Okay. Um, you want to break tasks down into simple steps and give one direction at a time. So again, depending on where the person is in their in their dementia journey, if they're fairly early on, you know, they'll be able to do one task at a time. But if you say to them, you know, uh, could you do me a favor and, you know, go in the kitchen and in the cabinet over the sink, there's a measuring cup and I need, well, there's a blue one and a green one. Can you get me the blue, you know, forget it. 
Mm. You, they're not going to remember all that. They'll, they may remember the last thing that you said to them if you give them a laundry list of, you know, three or four tasks. So you really have to break that down. You know, go into the kitchen because once they get into then it's going to be like, okay, in the cabinet over the sink, find the sink. There's the cabinet. You know, can you get me a, a cup, a plate, whatever you want to get. Right. Okay, but it's one direction at a time because, again, all those multiple, you know, directions are just going to get lost in the shuffle. And generally, they'll remember the last thing you said to them because that's the most recent thing they heard. Right. So right. the beginning, if you said go to the kitchen, you know, and the, all, the last thing they heard was get a cup, it's going to be like, okay, where do, now i got to figure out, well, where do I find a cup? Mm. Because they may be beyond the point of remembering that the kitchen is likely the place. Okay. This one is, again, super important. Talk in positive terms. I, I used to hear this all the time, especially with home health aides, nurses' aides, don't, and caregivers. You know, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. No, I don't want that one. Get, talk in positive terms. Because when you think about it, if you say, um, uh, you know, we're, we're going out this morning, as opposed to, well, we're not going to go out or, or we're going to go out this afternoon, Okay. As opposed to, well, no, we're not going to go out this morning. We're going to, because then the person has to figure out, well, if we're going out, but we're not going out this morning, then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They have to, they have to have the wherewithal to figure that out. Mm -hmm. You know, if I say, don't go out the door, instead of, I need you to stay in the house, or I need you to stay in this room, or I need you to just sit on the couch for five minutes, as opposed to, don't get off the couch. Because don't mm -hmm. get off the couch is like, okay, well, then what's the, what's the opposite? What am I supposed to do? And with somebody who's having confusion and memory mm -hmm. issues, it's really hard to reverse that and sift it through and figure out, if you don't want me to do that, what do you want me to do? Oh, so okay. tell them, talk in positive terms. Tell them what you do want the, them to do. I want you to just, you know, I want you to go brush your teeth or I want you to go get dressed as opposed to, well, you can't, you know, don't, don't hang around in your pajamas right, all day right okay well if I don't hang around in pajamas, what am I doing it's time to go get dressed so talk in positive very terms. directive yeah yeah okay. by the way that's another one that works well with with kids because kids are the same way if you give kids a bunch of negative commands they have to figure out well what am I supposed to do if you're telling right. me what I shouldn't do or what right. not to do what am I supposed to do yeah that's you a know, great point don't stay out late as opposed to I want you in by 11 o'clock. Right. Okay, that gives me, that's very directive. That's give me some direction. cut and dry. Have to be, because don't stay out late. Well, what's your definition of late? Mm. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of confusing things about that. The other thing that I have found this to, to be with some people have a tendency to use pronouns instead of names. I have people that, you know, like young people that do this. They talk about she or him. And you're, you're, you're that, well, who are we talking about? Mm. And they assume that you know, you know, that it's another staff member, my husband, my wife, you know, whatever. You really want to avoid the use of pronouns. So instead of me telling someone with dementia, oh, I had a nice chat with Harry on Monday afternoon, it would, you know, it would be, I, I don't want to say, well, I, yeah, oh, I was chatting with him. Well, with who? Mm. You know what I mean? So you really... And and people do that, I think, especially within families. Oh, he already took out the trash. Well, who's he? Mm. You know, assuming that you know it was, you know, the son or the right, daughter or, right. you know, whoever. So just to view that. Um, the other thing, too, is when you say things like here it is um, instead of here's your hat, you know, or here's your jacket, as opposed to, oh, yeah, there it is. There's what? You know, you, you want to identify things. Just as we started out saying you want to identify who you are as a person and not walk in a room and start chatting with somebody and assume that they know who you are because they, they recognize you. Um, they may recognize you as somebody they should know, but if they, again, if they don't have a context, so it's important to start with who you are and, you know, put it in a context. I'm Tina. I'm, you know, Al's daughter or I'm Dave's sister or whatever you want to say. Um, and it's the same thing with uh, avoiding pronoun, uh, pronouns. Um, another technique is to turn questions into answers. So 
rather than asking a question, especially if it seems rather obvious, you want to provide the solution. So for example, um, instead of saying, when you're a caregiver, you, you pick on up on, especially on ver, um, verbal and physical cues. So a, a lot of times caregivers, I find particularly spouses, are pretty in tune with, say, when somebody needs to use the restroom. So instead of saying, do you have to use the bathroom? You say, the bathroom is right here. Oh. You know what I mean? So you're already you're already giving them the solution. If they don't need to use it, they're going to wave their hand or say no, or you know, and that's fine. But you've already given them the solution as opposed to do you need to use the bathroom? Mm. Because that requires, oh, I got it. now I have to figure this out. Do I? Mm. It may be like I'm not really sh- even sure what the bathroom is for. If, if they couldn't, if they forget what the word bathroom means, so this way, you know, oh, the bathroom's right here, and now you're showing, and there's a toilet. Oh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm going. Mm. So anything like that, if you can provide a solution as opposed to just asking the question, are you hungry, instead of asking, are you hungry, here, look, I, ha- I cut up some apple. How about a snack? Oh, yeah, well, yeah. here it is. I can see it. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Yeah, yeah. now that I think about it, I'm hungry. <laughs> so you're already providing the solution. And that eliminates all of the turmoil of, well, trying to communicate the needs and the wants. Mm. So it's, it, it, is, it, it is a skill, I think, that caregivers just learn after a relatively short period of time in a relatively, um, you know, in an environment where they're doing a lot of caregiving. Mm. So, um, you need to be very careful about literal expressions. You know, I think of like um, uh, people with autism who oftentimes take, you know, sort of expressions too literally and that can also happen with people with dementia so if you say you know you pull up to the car hop in that may be what they try to do you know so you want to be um you want to be really careful about that and just Mm. now it is okay to use uh, expressions that they would be very familiar with or maybe expressions that they've used a lot um because those are those are stored in the long-term memory so um, I often hear expressions that, you know, out of the seniors, well, we'll see you tomorrow. Well, if the, what is it, if the crick don't rise or whatever. Oh. Yeah, you know what I mean? God willing and the crick don't rise. Well, I remember the first time I heard of that, I said, what? I, <laughs> I had never heard that expression. But so many of the seniors used it. Now, if they use that, I, I don't think they would take that literally of, as a creek rising right. because that's an expression that they would be familiar You're with. Right. So, And some, you know, families have expressions. And, you know, and those are fine because mm-hmm. those are things that people are going to be familiar with and kind of revert back to that. So... Here is my takeaway for, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit, but if, if you don't remember anything else that I've talked about today, when you communicate with someone with dementia, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Because people, again, on their journey through dementia, as they progress in the disease, communication becomes more and more difficult in both directions. It becomes more difficult for them to get their message across, and it becomes more difficult for them to understand what you're saying. And so um, really just trying to pick up on, um, on feelings becomes so important. Mm. So how you communicate, how you say things is just crucial. Mm. Um, somebody with dementia can certainly sense your emotions even if he or she can't comprehend what you're saying. Mm. And, you know, you think about that. If you, if you were watching television and you had the sound turned off and just watching the actors and actresses, you know. You can figure out. You can figure out. Anger. Is this a scene where there's tension in the Happy. air, where there's joy, right. where there's, you know, confusion? Yeah. And so somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia will do the same thing mm. just based on your tone, your body language. I mean, there's so many things that we, so many cues that we give that we may not be aware of. Um, If you raise your voice, the person is going to sense anger, frustration, impatience, you know, all of those things that are not Mm. healthy, Um, panic. And what we find is in those situations, um, things can quickly escalate out of control. So, Let's, for an example, I was trying to think of a good example. So let's say, and I've 
again, I've seen this because, you know, sometimes people with dementia will wander. They'll wander outside of the house um, and they're not always safe in doing so. So let's say that someone with dementia crosses the street. I was thinking of the old senior center, four lanes of traffic, oh, yeah, you know, sure. into traffic, right? right? Or maybe against the, the walk signal, even if there, if, if there is one. And a bystander sees the whole thing, starts yell, yelling at the person to be more careful. What are you doing? My God, you're going to get hit by a car. And they're doing it out of concern. I mean, they're not angry at the person, but they're upset with the fact that, my gosh, I almost witnessed somebody, right. you know, getting hit by a car. Um, and what happens the person then becomes more agitated because now they're in the middle of a walkway with traffic and confusion, and that leads to agitation. It may The person may have a meltdown. They may start crying. They wow. may start yelling. I mean, you know, I have seen those situations, Harry, escalate in like a matter of a minute and a half, two mm. minutes, where, you know, somebody just goes off on somebody, again, out of concern. Um or, you know, another um, example is um, somebody, and this, this has happened, somebody's in line at the grocery store, and we have somebody who's maybe earlier on, you know, maybe showing some, some initial early signs of some kind of confusion, memory loss, and so forth. They go to the grocery store, they go to pay for their groceries, they don't have enough money. They think they do, they don't. Now you've got the cashier saying, well, you don't have enough money here, do you have more money in your wallet? Or do you want me to put some items back? And now you get into a situation where that person has to make a decision and they've got to think through that process. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, because in their head, first of all, what do you mean I don't have enough money? I'm sure that I have enough money. I'm, I'm sure that I put enough money in my wallet, but clearly they didn't. Then you've got the cashier who now is watching the line start to form, oh, right? Yeah. So now we've got, instead of two people, now we got four people in line. Yeah. And now this is, so now the cashier is going to come back with, you know, well, I, why don't, you know, I'll put some, I'll take some items out. What, what items do you want me to take out? Now the person with dementia has to figure that out and mm -hmm. they don't really want to do that. So, you know, again, that can lead to agitation. That can lead to lashing out at the cashier or just, you know, a meltdown in tears because now the person clearly realizes this is embarrassing. Yeah. I don't know how this could happen. Um, you know, what happens? So those kinds of things, when we go back to what I first started with on sort of creating that dementia-friendly community, these are the kinds of things that happen, that can happen out in the community. Um, and, you know... I, it, I've had calls from bankers, from tellers at banks. I've got somebody here that's, you know, having a meltdown, mm. and they don't have enough money in their account. They're trying to take out $100. They don't have $100. Um, and they're, you know, and again, the situation is usually either now the person is, like, screaming at me, screaming at the bank. I want to see the president. Mm. Everyone around them is upset and uncomfortable. Or the person has dissolved into tears. What happened? Somebody must have stolen this money. I'm sure I had this money in my account. Right. Um, and I can't tell you the number of calls that we've gotten from local banks. Uh, you know, what do we do? So I'm going to give you a couple of tips on what to do. If you're in a situation like that where clearly the person is, con is confused and agitated, um, first of all, the main thing, you go back to just regular communication. Remain calm. Maintain eye contact, so you really want to lock eyes with the person. Again, try to keep your voice low-pitched, because the lower pitched that your voice is and the slower that you speak, the you know, you're going to create that atmosphere of calm. I will often almost, this is, and here's my, this is my own personal tip. I don't think you'll find it in any of the, you know, geriatric journals or yeah. anything. I find that the louder that the other person gets, the softer that I try and get. Uh -huh. Sometimes I'm almost whispering, and it forces, even if, even if the person has a hearing loss, it forces them to quiet down enough to, because I've, I'm, I've again, I've got eye contact, I've locked eyes with them, and I'm just keeping it slow, and I'm keeping it low. I'm just trying to de-escalate the situation. And in order for them to hear me, sometimes they have to quiet down, because I've dropped to almost a whisper. Mm. The other thing that I will typically do, you need to be a little careful with this, but I find this generally to be effective. I'll either put my hand like on their arm or maybe on their back, you know, to just, that 
it just gives that feeling of calm and it lets mm. them know I am I'm right here. I'm with you. Yeah, we're going to sure. we're going to figure this out together. You know, this isn't a big thing. Um it might be like in the grocery store situation. If I were the person behind the person that was happening, I might say to them, "You know what? This is all a little bit confusing. So, you know what? Why don't you put back whatever two items and cuz you can always come back tomorrow." figure it out and you know come back tomorrow there's you know is is this something that you what you know is this something that you need like right away and you know chances are if there were 12 items that they were buying there's one or two that I can live without you know yeah. so again just offering a solution not offering a bunch of, bunch of options but just you know what you can come back tomorrow or you can come back later today you know it's not a big thing mm -hmm. it's you know to just sort of try to de-escalate that situation so you know Again, the one when the one thing to take away from this is it's not what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. You know, think about I was thinking about this on the way over. If you said the words, what do you if you ask the question, what are you doing? Okay? There are a lot of ways to ask that. And so here's what I mean when I say this is my this is my takeaway for it's not what you say, but how you say it. If I walked into a room, Harry, and let's say you were, I don't know, working on a hobby or a project. And I come in the room and I say, oh, what are you doing? Okay, that's one way to say it. I'm enthusiastic. I'm, I want information. This is fun. This is joyful. If I come in, in the room and I say, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? Or what are you doing? I mean, there are all kinds of different, it's the same right. thing. One sounds more like an ac accusation, like right. you're doing something you shouldn't right. be doing. Right. I mean, you know, what about the mother who goes in and her kid's working on a science project and is like taking everything out of her, you know, using all of her good china dishes or something. Right. But it's like, what are you doing? You know, you're not, you're not <laughs> mad at the kid for doing the science project, but you're upset because, you know, you're using my good china. Um, versus, ooh, what are you doing? You know, so what... The way you say things, your tone of voice, your inflection, your body language, it just says so much. And in so many cases with someone with, again, especially as they get into their dementia or Alzheimer's, if they're in the very late stages, communication with any meaning is so challenging. It's really, at that point, all about feeling. Mm. It's just making the person feel okay. It's, it's trying to keep the environment calm because, again, those situations can escalate out of control right. so quickly. And for what? You know, what you have to look at what's the purpose here, you know? You, because if you're, if you're a caregiver and the person's getting agitated and you're getting agitated and then they're more upset, now you're more upset, like, okay whatever the message was it was trying to get across is it's it's a moot point mm. everybody feels lousy mm. you know um and so you're really just trying to keep everybody kind of in that you know homeostasis yeah, i guess you right. know just sort of trying to keep things calm right so there's my message you know this is a really pertinent topic uh no question because i i dare say there's hardly anyone that's not affected by this uh, and I, it, would you classify it as a disease? Or, well, or yep. A... Al well, I mean, Alzheimer's is a disease. Dementia is actually not a disease. Dementia is, it's it's not as much a diagnosis because there is an underlying cause of dementia. Okay. So, there, so there are like, uh, and Beth Cardilla will tell you, there's like 500 different types of dementia. So there are hundreds right. of dementias. It might be Lewy body dementia. It might be a dementia related to, you know, AIDS or, I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, different diseases, Parkinson's disease. There's a dementia that's unique to Park to those with Parkinson's. Not everybody has it, so not everybody with Parkinson's is going to show signs of dementia. There's a certain percentage that probably will. That dementia is a little different than Alzheimer's, which is a little different right. than multi-infarct dementia, which is caused by a series of strokes. Um, so dementia in and of itself is less of a diagnosis. It's really whatever the underlying cause is. But yes, all of those things, there is some underlying disease process that's causing that mm. confusion and that memory loss. Typically, we'll see with Alzheimer's, 
there tends to be a steadier decline. Now, it isn't necessarily rapid. It may be a very slow, steady decline over years. Yeah, right. um, generally, with Alzheimer's, what we find is the later that someone is diagnosed, the slower the progression of the disease. Okay. So someone who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's in, you know, when they're 80 or 85, they're probably not going to die of Alzheimer's. They're going to probably die of something else because the progression of the disease is going to be fairly slow. It'll be generally steady, but, you know, it may take months and years. Someone who's diagnosed earlier, early onset Alzheimer's, that tends to be a steadier, quick, it's a quick decline. Um, somebody with multi-infarct dementia, which is dementia caused by strokes, that tends to be very erratic. So that's more of, you know, they'll have a stroke or a transient ischemic attack, which is a small stroke, a TIA. So they may, you know, we may see some cognitive issues. And then nothing happens for six months or mm. eight months or a year. And then they ha then there's another incident. And then we see more decline. So with multi-infarct, I, I usually say it almost looks like a staircase. And, it you know, the landing, it just depends on how long, whereas Alzheimer's tends to be more of a, a steadier progression. Okay. Um, and again, but that it could be like the progression going down this way, or it could be very kind of flat and just, you know, sort of a slow, steady progression. Um, so all of those things, you know, that's why it's important to have an understanding of what the underlying cause is, because there are some treatments that will slow the progression. Um, mm. And certainly if people are having, you know, a series of strokes, there are you know, lots of things that we can do to manage that. Mm -hmm. And in managing the physical symptoms, you're also helping to manage some of those cognitive declines right. as well. So um, all, you know, all important things to yeah. be aware of. Well, I, you know, as I sit here listening to you, um, and the, the other thing before I go into that, I, I want to remind our viewers that we did have Beth Cordell, Beth Cordillo. Beth Cordillo, Cordillo. on this show yeah. um, several on. months ago. Yep. And I, but if you go on to YouTube and type mm -hmm. in West Hill Council on Aging Presents, yep. you'll see all of these shows. Yep. They just stack up. And somewhere you're going to find that interview with her. Yeah. And that would be a good one for you to reference in addition to this because Absolutely. that will give you a lot of the background underlying causes of what causes and how to deal with yep. dementia. Yep. Um, but, you know, what I've taken away from this is patience. Yes. You know, I have a very good friend whose wife has now been diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's. And as he said, Harry, I'm not a patient person. He's a very type A individual. Mm -hmm. He said, I've really had to work hard mm -hmm. on my patience and understand it's not her it's the, mm -hmm. it's the Alzheimer's that's creating yep. this, but yep. it tests me because I'm repeating the same thing or answering the same question mm -hmm. time and time and time again. So it's so critical. I think, you know, one of the things, though, in that situation, Harry, is, um, and it's kind of, it's timely because, you know, of the pandemic, we all had to look at things differently. We all had to change our perspective right. during the pandemic. And I think that's the same when you're, a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's. Um, and I, you know, I, I used to fly down to Tennessee about every six weeks to spell my, my parents were living down there and just to spell my mom and, and to kind of, you know, take over and work with my dad. And, you know, as frustrating as it was for my mom, I took, just really joy in the time that my dad and I had to spend together. It was very different than, because my dad was a chemical engineer. He worked for the U.S. government. He worked for the Defense Department, you know, had 40 people under him that he supervised. So prior to the Alzheimer's, our conversations were very intellectual. You know, <laughs> they were. I mean, he was interested in my right. work, but in my education and in my training. Right. And, right. And, and and things changed drastically. Yeah. But not necessarily for the better or for the worse. It was just different. And then I took joy in some of the, you know, just some of the quality time spent listening to music. You know, of course, we did the, the piece on music and just but just really enjoying that together and singing along together and, you know, maybe reading stories together or reminiscing together, mm. or looking at photo albums. So, you know, it it is hard for someone with, you know, kind of that type A get it done personality because, for someone with dementia, you just you live each moment truly 
you know, just in the moment. It's just mm. you're living in the moment because you can't necessarily remember the past. You're, right. You can't really process the future. It's just what we have right now. So I find that, and I'm, because I'm a type A person, so I get it. So I, I find that the best thing that your friend can do, and if you want to be a good friend and give them some, some helpful advice would just be just try to scale back you know, change your expectations and just enjoy some of those moments because they can be really special. I, I have to say, as difficult as it was with my father, I can remember we were sitting out on the front porch, um, just the two of us. My mom was in cooking dinner, and um, my dad and I were just kind of reminiscing about some things. <laughs> and of course, he was all over the map with what he was talking about, and, you know, his work kept kept like getting confused with he was a volunteer firefighter so that was thrown in there and he did some other volunteer work so it was all meshing together but that's okay um and you could hear in the distance there was a train tr there were train tracks near where my parents lived and in the distance you could hear the train wh whistle and in mid-sentence my father stopped and he said oh I love it when I hear that train whistle he goes I used to love trains and so, you know, and then he started to, and then we got into this whole conversation about trains. Do you know to this day, every time I hear a train whistle, yes. it makes me smile. You think I think of my that. dad, yeah, and I sure. think about that time on the porch. It was, you know, in the late afternoon. It was a nice day. It was in the summer. It was beautiful. We were just enjoying the moment. And that is, that's, you know, that's one of my memories. It's a great memory. Yeah, that so. is a great memory. Uh, the other pieces that I have picked out of this, eye contact, how it mm -hmm. important it is to be able to yep. be verbal, but yep. for them to see what you're saying and, and your expressions. Um, watching, you know, the pitch voice, keeping it low and calm, really an understanding personality and having empathy for what they're dealing with. Watch your speech patterns. Keep your explanations short and clear so they understand. Be direct. That was a great tip. Yeah. And, you yeah. Know, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and it's not what you say, but how you, how say, you it. say it. How you say it. Yeah. It's a lot of nodding, a lot of right. smiling, you right. know, and that eye contact. I think the other the other thing that's important about that is that you're reassuring the person that you are absolutely engaged you're listening to them. Right. They're being heard. Right. Even if you're not understanding, they're being heard. And that's really important because people just, you know, they need to feel like, well, what I'm saying is important to you. Mm -hmm. And when you establish eye contact, it is. And I think that that's, you know, that's something that we often don't do. And that's, right. you know, that we need to. We need to do that. Is there printed information? Do you have flyers at the Senior Center on this topic? I'll tell you the best resource for any of this. I do. Um, but also the Alzheimer's Association, okay. the local Alzheimer's Association, which is based in Springfield. They have, they have, I mean, if you're computer savvy, just go to the Alzheimer's Association. Their website is filled with all of this information. Okay, um, good We job. have some resources at the Senior Center. We have a whole um, section of resources, just resource materials, including Alzheimer's. We have books that people can, um, can borrow from the Senior Center, some mm -hmm. really good resource books. Um, but, yeah, our local Alzheimer's Association, when we do our, our chili luncheon, our Cops for a Cause chili luncheon, and we raise money for our local Alzheimer's Association. And that's one of the reasons, because their, um, their information and their resources are just outstanding. And even if the person doesn't have Alzheimer's, if they have a dementia then a lot of, you know, a lot of that information is going to pertain to, to yeah. someone with dementia as well. So. Well, Tina Gorman, Executive Director of the Westfield Senior Center, thank you so much for coming in today. Really pertinent topic. You have, you have, this is one of these conversations I would need to listen to three times because yep. you have delivered a lot of information, yeah. and I'm guessing for a lot of people, there's a lot here to take in, but it's a complex subject, and we want to do the best job we can for those loved ones who we're dealing with in these kinds of situations, and we certainly understand the challenges that can go on with this. But I think also, to Tina's point, if you're looking for more information, certainly stop by the Senior Center. They can help you or at least direct you in the right place. Mm -hmm. But get on your computer or on your tablet and Google, go to your browser and look up Alzheimer's Association. And there you'll be able to find the information. And I'm sure you can also call them to get more direct help if you need it.
So I want to say uh, thanks to Pete Coles, our outstanding WCPC Westville Cable Channel 15 manager for hosting this, and to Tina Gorman for coming in, executive director. Thank you for all your support for everything you do for our seniors in Westfield. Uh, there is no one I know of that has more passion and love and devotion for this population f and for everything that just goes around that. And, yeah. you know, you're just, you've done an incredible job down there. And we, Thank you. Thank you very, for the opportunity we're, to we're come really in. I think this is, um, you know, I think the whole series, the Council on Aging Presents it's been series, has just been such a great opportunity to get it some really, really important information out there. Um, I know we've gotten some great feedback from seniors. I mean, I know I have some seniors who, like each month, it doesn't really matter what the topic is. They're tuning in each month. Oh, that's because, great. Um, and I really applaud them because they feel like, well, I'm going to learn something. Right. And this is one of those situations where even if you don't have a family member, and by this time most of us do, or a friend, most of us do, that's you know dealing with some type of dementia. Uh, but even if you're just out on the street, in the bank, in the grocery store, you know, you're going to run into this. So just right. having some, you know, just, again, if you don't take away anything else, stay calm, lower your voice, lower your pitch, just try to stay calm, establish eye contact, and you'll, you know, just reassure. It'll, it'll be fine. Yeah. It really will. I do want to uh, remind our viewers that uh, this does play every Tuesday at 245. So if you happen to have missed one or maybe came in late, or you do want to listen to it a second time, you can certainly tune in uh, any, t any Tuesday of that given month. You'll be able to find it. And I will also remind you that this is a, we tape it to YouTube, and you can just go onto YouTube, type in Westfield Council on Aging Presents. You will see all of the, and we've probably done 16 or 18 yeah. of these yep. now, yep. but all the different topics that we have taped, they're all there. You can go back and you can watch any of the ones that you have uh, missed. So on behalf of Pete Coles and Tina Gorman, our phenomenal guest today, I am Harry Rock. You have been watching another edition of Westfield Council on Aging Presents on WCPC Westfield Cable Channel 15. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next show.